hello, I'm Keith Frankish, and uh, James Ando has asked me to say a few words about my paper, Illusionism as a Theory of Consciousness. Uh, James has suggested uh, a few questions, which, uh, which I have here, and uh, I'll, I'll go through them. Um, so first, James asks, what was your motivation for writing the piece? And why do you think it's important? Well, what motivated me to write the paper um, was that I believe that many philosophers and some scientists are thinking of consciousness in the wrong way. Um, now, it's not just that they have some mistaken beliefs about it. I think they, the whole picture that they have is wrong. And the sort of picture they have is, is, is something like this. Everyone agrees that when we're conscious, our brains are carrying out some immensely complex functions. So sensory systems are registering information about the world and they're sending this information to control systems within the brain, which are in turn producing a vast range of, of reactions and responses. But the idea that, the bad idea I think, is that all of these all of these functions could be carried out without consciousness in a sort of mechanical, robotic way. Consciousness, on what I think is the bad view, uh, is supposed to involve something else, something over and above all this information processing. It's supposed to involve our being aware of a private inner world of mental qualities, a sort of inner show, a show of mental colors, sounds, smells, and so on. And these mental qualities, qualia they're sometimes called, or phenomenal properties, the term I use in the paper, these, these qualities don't seem to be part of the physical world, at least as we ordinarily understand it. I think this is quite a tempting view, and there are reasons for adopting it, but I think it's it's wrong. Um, I think it's deeply misguided. And I want to explain why it's wrong and to suggest a better picture. Now, I think this is important because the this inner world picture of consciousness is sending people off on what I think are wild goose chases. They're trying to explain how the brain produces these private phenomenal properties and how these properties are related to the functions the brain performs. And they're getting into all kinds of tangles in trying to answer these questions. And I think this is certainly not helping uh, as I understand consciousness, and I think it's actually getting in the way of our understanding it. Okay, so that's the that's the first question. Second question James has is, um, how has your thinking developed since this piece was published? Is there anything you'd like to change? Well, I hope my thinking about this has advanced a bit in the in the last few years, but it hasn't changed radically, and I. I haven't come to reject any of the central claims in the paper, so I'd stand by the paper. What I would do, perhaps, is express those claims um, a little differently and anticipate some ways in which they might be misunderstood. In particular, I'd stress that I'm not denying the existence of consciousness in an everyday pre-theoretical sense. I'm I'm not saying that we don't see and hear and, and feel and, and, and uh, feel pain and so on. Um, what I'm denying is a certain view of what consciousness is. Um, the view that says it involves um, awareness of a private mental world of phenomenal properties. And in the paper, I express this by saying that phenomenal consciousness doesn't exist, where I 
use the term phenomenal consciousness precisely to mean this this private world of phenomenal properties. So I'm denying the existence of consciousness in a certain technical or theoretical sense, not in the everyday sense. I think that's clear in the paper, but um, some people have misunderstood me as denying that consciousness exists at all. Um, I think I would also say more about my positive view of consciousness, about what I would replace the inner world picture with. Um, that's a big topic, um, and it's something that I'm trying to spell out in, in, uh, in the work I'm doing now. The core idea is something like this, that uh, to have a conscious experience of something is to be related to it in a certain very complex way, um, to be highly sensitive to it and highly responsive to it. Uh, so when you, when you attend to something perceptually, your sensory systems are registering detailed information about it and they're broadcasting this information to a wide range of, uh, of control systems in your brain. And these systems in turn are producing a, a vast range of, of reactions, physiological, psychological, behavioral. And none of this involves anything like awareness of an inner world. It will involve your brain constructing representations and models of the outer world, but you yourself aren't aware of these. These, um, these representations aren't, aren't an inner picture of the world. They're, we might think of them as bits of machinery that make you, the person, the whole organism, highly sensitive to the world and highly responsive to it. And it's this extreme sensitivity and responsiveness that we call consciousness. That's the idea. So where in that picture does the notion of illusion come in? Well, the idea is this, that it's that we have, an, we humans at least have another level of sensitivity. Um, as well as having external senses, we also have a, something like an internal sense, introspection. Um, and this is a sort of self-monitoring system within the brain. And the system registers information about our own brain processes and passes this information on to higher level control systems. So our brains are monitoring themselves as well as monitoring the world. And again, this will involve processes of representation and modeling and so on. And it makes us, the, the, uh, the person, sensitive to, to what's happening in our own brains. We can notice that we're noticing things and react to our own reactions. And it's these introspective processes that make us think that we're aware of a private inner world of phenomenal properties. The private inner world is a kind of illusion or fiction that's created by the brain's self-monitoring. So that's the core idea. Now, perhaps it would have been helpful to have stated that right at the beginning of the paper or near the beginning of the paper because it's, it's a picture that's assumed in the rest of the paper, I think. Okay, now, um, James also asks, what objection to your arguments in this piece do you think deserves to be taken most seriously? I think I'll... I might leave that one for you to think about. Um, but I will mention two objections. Uh, they're not actually the ones that I think deserve to be taken most seriously. I, in fact, I, I think they just miss the point. But they are ones that come up very often. So I think it's worth mentioning them. Uh, again, I, I, think the, I think the answers are in the paper, but perhaps I could have done more to, to emphasize them. One objection is that illusions are themselves experiences and therefore they involve phenomenal consciousness and so my view is self-defeating 
the illusion of phenomenal consciousness consciousness is itself going to be a phenomenally conscious experience well the answer to this of course is that on the view i'm proposing no experiences involve phenomenal consciousness illusory or otherwise consciousness is an informational and reactive process and illusions occur when the information is misleading and the reactions are inappropriate so you could say that being conscious is being tuned into the world and having an illusion is being mistuned into the world so if you're in, under the illusion that there's a, a pink elephant in front of you you're tuned into the world in a pink elephant way you think and react as if there's a pink elephant there but the illusion doesn't involve there really being a mental pink elephant in your mind you know, being mistuned into the world doesn't mean doesn't involve being well tuned into some mental reality it's enough just to be mistuned into the world and exactly the same goes for the introspective illusion that i talk about the illusion of of the private inner world being under an introspective illusion involves being mistuned to the reality of what's happening in your brain it involves thinking and and reacting as if there's a private inner show there private inner world of phenomenal properties and it doesn't involve there really being some mental version of that uh, private show um, and the other objection that that often comes up and it's related to that one is is to ask who who's the subject of this illusion uh, must there be some conscious observer who experiences the illusion well the answer to that is is simply that the subject of the illusion is, is just you the person it's not some conscious self inside your head the illusion doesn't involve uh, an inner an inner observer watching an inner show the illusion is you thinking that there's an inner observer watching an inner show okay um the next question is uh how do the ideas or arguments you discuss in the piece speak to the situation around covid19 ah uh, I, I don't think i i can make a link there it's, there probably is one to be made but i'm uh, I, I can't right now think of one uh, so perhaps perhaps one will occur to you uh and the final question is James's final question is what do you think people have in mind when they ask what is the meaning of life and how do you think your piece can help contribute to an answer wow uh I'm going to kind of, I'm going to dodge this one I'm going to let you think about that I'll just say this I think the paper does have some implications for questions like that for what it's about the subject really is what kind of beings we are what kind of creatures we are and what we can know about each other on the, the view that I reject the inner world view there's an important part of us the, the, the essence of us if you like uh, that doesn't belong to the public world we all share it's a, it, it consists in a private mental world that's sealed off from the rest of the world and from other people it's as if we live each of us in a, in a private mental bubble which no one else can ever enter and we can never really know what other people feel and we can't be sure even be sure that other creatures are, are, are conscious are fish conscious how do we know do they have this private mental mental world how could we tell it's invisible to science now the illusionist paints a very very different picture of the kind of beings we are uh, but the illusionist consciousness isn't some hidden essence that's separate from the world it's the illusionist view consciousness is a, a complex web of sensitivity and reaction 
tunes us into the world. And in principle, we could know everything about another person's consciousness or another group's consciousness. We could trace all their sensitivities and reactions. So on this view, we're all part of the same world. And there's, there's nothing deeply hidden. And if that's right, then I think it does have quite profound implications for our conception of what we are, our relations to each other, our place in the natural world. And so for the meaning of life. But I'll let you think about that. So that's a little introduction to my to my paper. I hope you enjoy it and I'd be interested to know what you think of it. Thank you for listening.